Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stan Adams. Uh, I'm with the Center for Democracy and Technology. Uh, CDT is a nonprofit advocacy organization based in Washington, D.C. Uh, we work to ensure that laws and policies uh, promote rights uh, that we all enjoy in the regular world, in the digital environment as well. Um, this is my colleague, Natasha. Hi, I'm Natasha Duarte. Um, I used to work at CDT and in fact did at the time when Stan and I submitted this tutorial. Um, I now work at Upturn, uh, which is also a DC-based nonprofit. Um, Upturn works to advance justice and civil rights wherever technology is used. Um, so obviously Stan and I come at this from a very policy-centric background um, and also a, a US-centric one, so we will um, be including um, some EU perspectives in here as much as possible, but we're um, sorely deficient in, in that area and in representing other parts of the world. So apologies for that up front. <laughs> um, and, and please, um, there'll be lots of opportunities for participation. So to the extent that um, your part of the world um, or issue area is not represented, um, please uh, bring those, those issues uh, into the discussion. Um, so a bit about what we plan to cover this morning. Um, this will be a very basic introduction to what policy is, um, what policy making opportunities look like and how to find them, um, how to get involved in the policy making process. Uh, if you have ever done a legal internship or have any sort of experience like that, you probably won't learn very much new uh, in this tutorial. However, if you are um, brand new to the world of policy making, then I think you're, you're in the right spot. Um, okay, so would anyone like to volunteer their idea of what policy is? This is not a law school class. I'm not going to cold call anyone. <laughs> okay, so. Another caveat, we're both lawyers, um, not technologists, so please uh, also excuse any deficiencies in uh, precision or, or language. Um, we will be talking about policy in the broadest sense. Um, I had an argument with my wife last night about what policy is. She worked for the federal government and had a much more restrictive vision of what policy is, so this will be big policy um, in the same way that everyone now talks about AI as just a big amorphous thing. That's, that's where we're at with policy this morning or this afternoon. So, oops. My slides are broken. Oh, they are showing. They're just not showing for me. Okay. So, some of these things are policy. Some of these things are people engaging in policy making. Um, you can see it is a wide variety of things and we, we tried to narrow it down to things that are uh, applicable for this community. Um, some of these are policy in the strictest sense. So the HUD example um, is a broad overarching uh, non-discrimination set of goals um, and HUD implements those goals, implements the ideas to achieve those goals uh, through rulemakings. Um, some of these other things are other examples of, of corporate policy um, and broad European policy there for the, the uh, AI framework. Um, why is policy important? Anyone? Has anyone here been impacted by a policy ever? <laughs> yes, you, you should all raise your hands. Yes, all the time. I may or may not have violated our corporate policy by bringing my own laptop here. Um, policy can be a ban on facial recognition. Policy can be a new defense against discrimination claims. Policy can be broad protection for intellectual property. Policy can be social media terms of service prohibiting reverse 
engineering and scraping. Policy can be choosing a model. Now, why do we care about this? Policies impact all of us. Policies impact our communities. Policies impact who gets protection and who gets access to resources. Policies shape the future. Policies define our day to day, every day. And policy making is up to all of us. Okay, Natasha. Um, so you. More? Oh, this, is this, this is me, right? This is you. Yeah, great. <laughs> you guys are going to learn really quickly that Stan and I talk at completely different rates, so apologies for whatever dissonance that causes you. <clears throat> Um, and what we're going to do uh, in a lot of this presentation is talk about examples and case studies of how um, people from um, all kinds of backgrounds, but especially um, technical ones, have participated in the policymaking process to make change, particularly change toward justice and fairness and protecting people's rights. Because um, I think those examples and case studies do a better job of illustrating how that can happen better than us just sort of trying to describe it abstractly to you. Um, and so while we're on the topic of what policy is, I wanted to talk through a few examples. Um, and so I'm sure that one of the first things that comes to mind when you think about what policy is, is you know, a government policy. And certainly there is a, a pretty big appetite right now for governments to make policies that affect technology. Um, one of those happened uh, just a few months ago when uh, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is the agency in charge of enforcing fair housing and preventing housing discrimination, um, issued a proposed rulemaking. So when a, a federal agency wants to make a new rule, which is a binding law, um, they issue a proposal and then there's a notice for um, a period for um, public comment um, and then the agency <coughs> usually attempts to address those comments um, before they issue a final rule. Um, so in this case, HUD has issued a rule um, that changes its, uh, the, sorry, did you have your hand up? Oh, sorry. You can raise your hand and ask a question, but I might accidentally think you had your hand up when you didn't. Um, sorry about that. Um, so, um, so HUD uh, is proposing to change the way that it has um, enforced against um, disparate impact in housing. So that's when housing discrimination is not based on um, a sort of explicit different treatment of people in different protected classes, but uh, when the policy is neutral on its face but results in discriminatory, um, uh, discriminatory effects. Um, so and, and this rule in particular um, had a piece in it that was about algorithms. So um, uh, HUD is, is creating a set of defenses for people who are accused of housing discrimination, but who are using algorithms to make the decisions that are alleged to be discriminatory. Uh, these algorithms could be algorithms that are um, used to deliver housing advertisements. They could be algorithms used to um, uh, determines the eligibility um, for a um, home loan or the rate of someone's home loan. Um, or they could be algorithms used to um, screen and do background checks on potential tenants who are applying for um, to live in a rental property. So there's a really wide range of algorithms that impact housing. HUD has broad authority over those things. Um, and so this could potentially cover that full range of things. And um, the defenses that HUD is proposing to create um, would be that if, if someone is alleging that um, your housing decision or tool creates a disparate impact, so results in, in um, uh, system, systematically different outcomes for people in protected classes, so um, that could be based on race, um, gender, age, things like that. Um, 
you can dismiss that claim, right, and avoid a lawsuit uh, by uh, raising one of these three defenses. Uh, the first is basically that none of the inputs for the model are protected classes or substitutes for protected classes. The second is that a recognized third party responsible for setting industry standards created or maintained the model. And the third is that a neutral third party analyzed the model and determined it was empirically derived and predictive of a valid objective. Um, there are lots of, of issues with this. Um, of course, a lot of us in this room who work on um, algorithms and discrimination know that um, simply removing uh, uh, sensitive characteristics or protected classes from the inputs of a model doesn't guarantee that it won't be discriminatory. Um, so I'm not going to go through you know all of those arguments right now, but I just wanted to raise this as an example of policymaking, and we're going to come back to it later in the presentation when we talk about how um, uh, computer scientists and advocates have um, collaborated and, and mobilized uh, against this rulemaking. Um, so policy is not just the rules um, or the laws that governments make, right? Policy can be the choice to use a particular algorithm or it can be how those rules get encoded into an algorithm. Um, so uh, last year at Fat Star, um, a team of researchers presented their work um, where they uh, discovered racial bias in a health algorithm that is used um, nationwide to uh, flag people for um, enrollment in um, programs that are, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, proactive um, healthcare programs for people who are at risk of having um, serious health problems um, like chronic diseases. And they found that um, because the model used um, healthcare costs as the main factor in determining who would be enrolled in these programs. Um, the, the African Americans who were, uh, were enrolled at um, a, a higher threshold of, like they were um, on average sicker than the white people who were enrolled because the algorithm didn't take into account differences in access to healthcare and how even if you're really sick, if you don't have access to um, health insurance or good care, your costs uh, will not reflect how sick you are. Um, and so I really like um, this quote from a, a paper that is actually going to be uh, presented later in the week um, from a group of researchers at Cornell, um, which is that to build and use a model is to make and to promote as useful a particular lens of understanding a social problem. Um, so in this case, uh, to uh, build a model that's based on cost or to choose cost as a, a lens of viewing um, how sick people are, um, you know, is not just a uh, small technical choice, right? It affects millions of people's lives and it also can um, affect long term how we understand a particular problem and that can carry over into future policies um, and future decision making. Um, so one last example of how um, policies can become encoded into algorithms that affect people's lives is um, uh, what's been happening in various states across the country with people who have disabilities. Um, so uh, in several states, uh, determinations that were previously made by humans about um, how much uh, disability care people qualified for or whether they qualify for care um, or how much their budget should be are um, being made by algorithms, and uh, in some cases, uh, people who have uh, disabilities who require uh, a lot of like full care, round the clock care, um, have seen their hours of care that they qualify for drastically cut with the introduction of new algorithms that are being used to determine what they qualify for. Um, and so this story, for example, highlighted a woman who, because her hours were cut, had to choose between um, going to church and um, going to, uh, uh, um, you know, 
being able to uh, care for herself in other ways. Um, and I think that story in particular highlights the fact that, um, you know, algorithms that are, are relying on just sort of quantitative indicators of how sick someone is or, or um, how their disability affects their lives um, don't necessarily incorporate all the things that make someone able to live a full independent life, like being able to go to church or being able to um, you know, go out and, and shopping and take care of themselves. Um, in some, so uh, these algorithms have been litigated in several states. Um, and uh, several of those cases have been successful in um, uh, getting the use of the algorithms enjoined. So states have been um, prevented from continuing to use the algorithms. Uh, in some cases, they have um, miscategorized people. Um, in some cases, they can have considered factors such as whether someone has um, family to care for them uh, that are not necessarily factors in the state's law that are supposed to be considered. Um, and in some cases, they um, view uh, uh, care differently um, based on whether the care is provided in an institution or in someone's home. And in fact, um, some of the main algorithms used to make these disability benefits determinations were developed in homes, in like nursing homes, and are being used for people who are living in their own homes. Um, so the types of care and the outcomes can be completely different. Um, and um, some of them are actually having the effect of um, pushing people toward institutionalization <laughs> who would otherwise live independently at home. Um, and so, you know, in some cases, it's an issue of the algorithm just, you know, being, doing a bad job of uh, encoding the actual rules. And in some cases, it is highlighting an underlying um, injustice in the way the system already works. All right, so shifting gears a bit, we've talked about what policy is and how it impacts us, um, but who, who makes it? This is probably the first thing that comes to mind, governments, right? They do uh, a few things to sort of implement high-level policies through laws, rules, and regulations. Um, but that extends further down to things like where they spend money, what things they buy. Um, <clears throat> and then some of the ways some of the opportunities to engage in that policy-making process are things like uh, asking for information from the government about what they're doing, being part of oversight committees, <clears throat> participating in public consultations. We're going to talk a lot more about that later. And attending public hearings and forums. This is, in democratic societies, our way of engaging with the policy-making process directly. Oops. Companies also make policy. They do so in two directions, right? They both influence the government to act on uh, their own interests, and they make decisions uh, within themselves that impact all of us as, as we use their products and services. This is all of us, civil society and academia. These are some ways that we engage in policy making uh, Natasha and I both do a good bit of le legislative and regulatory advocacy. Um, some of you may do community organizing. Uh, some of you may participate in various standard settings, uh, organizations, and, and governance bodies. Many of you do research. This research down the line impacts products and services that governments buy and use, uh, such as the uh, health determination algorithms that Natasha was just talking about. These guys uh, set the rules for the road, right? This is how industry aligns themselves to agree on what they're, what they're going to do standard-wise moving forward. Communities are more of the grassroots uh, type policy making, um, but it's also as small as like local governments. Um, 
we'll talk about this more also, but it's, it's super important uh, to engage at this level. This is where it impacts you most directly. Courts also, in, in interpreting the law, determine how decisions will be made in the future. Uh, we'll say a little bit more about how to, how to influence uh, court decisions moving forward. And then finally, as people are building and designing project, products and services, uh, the decisions they make along the way ultimately impact people at the end. All right. So how do you get involved? Where do you start looking? Government websites. In the United States, the Federal Register uh, publishes all notices and rules and proposed rules every day. Um, there are several others listed up there. You guys can check these out on your own. Um, it's the kind of thing that you need to be engaged with on a daily basis to really keep up. Um, so the HUD example that Natasha talked about earlier uh, is a tweak to an old rule that changed the way the rule worked, right? And the rule is implementing a law passed by Congress. So there are three or four different levels of policy making going on there. Um, and where the agencies come in is to say, here's how we're going to use this rule in action. You can also check uh, government procurement websites. There are a few listed here, FedScoop, um, SAM.gov, Federal News Network. Um, these are sort of government, I won't say watchdogs, but they, they keep up with where the government is spending money and what they're spending money on. Also, for folks who weren't here in the beginning, um, we already apologize for being very US-centric. Uh, just want to repeat that. Uh, so we are not presenting this as like the complete set of resources or um, entities that make policy and, um, you know, please feel free to uh, let us all know about others um, throughout. That's right. Um, so a great way that both Natasha and I and many others in our community keep up with what's happening in the policy space um, is through things like email listservs, people tell us. Um, Twitter is fairly active. Um, our own websites are pretty good places for all of you to go to see what's happening in the policy world. Um, and the Grail Network, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. Uh, likewise, uh, research and academic institutions um, are often doing cutting edge work on uh, leading policy issues. And lastly, um, the most direct form of Democratic participation is, is to go to the meetings that governments hold, speak your mind, say things that are important. Um, I just want to say one quick thing about advocacy groups and coalitions. Um, not that uh, policy groups should be sort of the gatekeeper to anyone participating in the process, um, but I will note that, you know, a lot of groups that work across things like civil rights and tech policy um, have coalitions, uh, for example, people who are focused on um, immigrants' rights and immigrant surveillance, um, you know, people who are focused on hiring. And so um, there are sort of forums for those things that you can be plugged into if you have a specific um, area where you are most interested in um, impacting policy or, or doing work that supports um, uh, policies that advance justice. Question? Sure. <laughs> I believe these slides will also be available um, perhaps on the ACM website, and then uh, I'll talk about where we will host them privately as well, or publicly, but not on the ACM website. So digging into a few of these uh, in a little bit more detail, I talked about the Federal Register earlier. Uh, this is the official journal of the U.S. government. They, every day, publish a new edition um, that will cover things like new rules, um, proposed rules, requests for information, upcoming dates of implementation of old rules that are now new. Um, 
you can check every day. I think they even allow you to set up sort of custom searches. So if you can enter a few keywords, they will then let you know when something is coming around. You can also track a particular thing that you're interested in. Exactly. Um, and this is also the sort of central location through which uh, you get linked to the commenting websites, um, which are often done on uh, regulations.gov. It's an, an associated website. Um, so this this is the official language. This is this is uh, where the documents and rules will will exist that are the the ones to comment on. Um, the Grail Network is a project that uh, I myself at CDT and a colleague at another nonprofit um, have put together. That is a group of academics and researchers, uh, many of whom are here at FATSTAR, um, with expertise in uh, a, a variety of, of fields. Um, the idea being to include their expertise in policymaking discussions. Um, so as policymakers are, uh, for instance, with, within the government um, or advisory bodies are considering uh, technically based um, rules or regulations, we can then hope to have them be more informed as to how that technology actually works. Um, but on our website, we also put sort of relevant policymaking opportunities that are coming up. So um, almost anything related to AI, if there's an opportunity to comment or to be involved, uh, I try my best to keep that website updated. Uh, Natasha, do you want to say a word or two about Jots? Yeah, um, so uh, JOTS is a, a project out of the, um, uh, the Harvard Data Privacy Lab, um, I think it's called. And um, this is uh, both a good resource for um, research that is directly relevant to ongoing policy issues and also a good place to publish that kind of research. Um, I think it's... Um, a pretty light lift in terms of, of getting work published here, as far as I know. Um, so this is a place where particularly students um, are publishing uh, really short uh, pieces of research that are um, directly responsive to or um, uh, you know raising an issue around um, a, a policy issue. So for example, um, uh, research that shows that government websites can't tell the difference between comments written by humans and comments written by computers. Obviously relevant for all the things we're talking about now. Uh, before we move on, uh, are there any questions up to this point? That either means we're doing a great job or a terrible job. <laughs> for now, we'll opt for the, the former. There'll be a Q&A at the end. Um, so this is our, our brainstorm building off of, you know, all of the great work that this community has done already about um, what you can do as um, a computer or data scientist or someone with a technical background um, to influence policy and advance justice. Um, you can surface flaws and biases in data sets um, and in some cases, work to um, fill those gaps. Um, you can uh, resist unjust design and use of technologies. So, um, you know, things like action from within companies matters. Like that is part of um, influencing policy. It influences what company policy is and can even influence what government policy is. Um, and also what the public thinks is um, or understands is okay and not. Um, supporting and soliciting community input in the design of systems and technologies. Um, so we see that happening now with um, a, a set of policies in um, various localities in the U.S. called um, under the umbrella of community control over police surveillance. So these are policies that require that um, there be a period of uh, hearings and community input before police departments can purchase or use new surveillance technologies. Um, but it doesn't have to be formal. If you are working on a tool, if you're um, at a company, 
uh, you can solicit the feedback, can and should solicit the feedback of people who will ultimately be um, impacted by what you're building. Um, you can provide technical support to advocates. Um, we really need it. Uh, it's really helpful um, when we want to, um, you know, push back against something or, or um, try to protect people's rights within a system where technology is involved. Um, we often need research support, um, technologist support um, to make sure that we understand how the system is working and in some cases to interrogate how it's working um, either for everyone or for a particular person um, whose rights we want to vindicate. Can I, can I just say if any of you are interested in providing such technical support for uh, advocates such as us, please talk to us after. <laughs> um, you can, of course, audit systems to diagnose both social or both technical and social problems, right? So not just um, uh, checking to see if the system is working and what it's doing, but um, sometimes those audits can surface um, underlying social problems with the system itself. For example, if the system of allocating funding and benefits to people with disabilities is um, pushing people who want to live independently at home towards institutions, right, that's not just the algorithm, it's the whole system. Um, and of course, a lot of the work at this conference uh, does that and is um, doing that more and more every year, I think. Um, you can use model design as an opportunity to question underlying policies. Again, I, I kind of stole this from um, the paper by the Cornell folks that's being presented um, this week, which is called uh, Roles for Computer Science in uh, Social... Pro Thank you! <laughs> it's a really good paper. Um, so I'm not going to scoop it, um, but uh, talks about how uh, encoding values into models can also be an opportunity to question those values. Um, and uh, you can communicate the limits of technology, also something um, that is in that paper, um, but something that I have participated in um, along with um, technologists looking at um, what you can do with natural language processing in terms of, um, you know, government surveillance or um, content moderation. Uh, it's, I think it's maybe getting better, but there was a period during which uh, Mark Zuckerberg was often talking about um, how natural language processing algorithms would um, be able to catch um, all of the bad speech uh, and uh, that's not true. Um, <laughs> so um, so I've, I've worked with others to sort of surface what the actual capabilities and limits of those tools are. Um, so those are just some things. I'm sure there are a lot of others and we should talk about them during the Q&A. I, I think that last uh, communicating the limits point is, is super important. Um, our lawmakers, our representatives in Congress and the Senate most of them do not understand how this works. Um, they need help. They need help from all of you. <laughs> all right. So I could start with a basic introduction of the structure of the US government, but I think that might be too basic. Um, Congress is, is our legislative body. They make the laws. Um, but in the lawmaking process, there are many steps in which uh, advocates can intervene uh, in hopes of either making the law better um, or stopping it altogether or uh, making it the least bad thing possible. Um, that's often where we find ourselves. Uh, so hearings, um, that's, where, that's where the debates happen. Um, Advocates uh, and experts are often called upon to provide testimony at such hearings. Um, it is a good opportunity to make points uh, in a public forum. Um, doesn't always influence the direction of the legislation. Um, valuable nonetheless. Um, 
Same with uh, roundtables and task forces and other forums. The government likes to have people involved. Um, however, it often has a an end goal in mind, um, and we try to influence that as best we can. Um, draft bills are a way of um, sometimes uh, the the staff in Congress will say, "Would you mind taking a look at this bill?" Um, that's often the best way to influence what legislation looks like. Um, we can provide definitions, we can change wording. Um, doesn't always work, but it's, uh, it's a very direct way of, of getting involved. Um, also, you know, just call your representative um, to the extent you can keep up with what, what bills they are working on. Um, that is a, perhaps the most influential way to get their attention, is to let, let them know their constituents are watching. Um, uh, some more sort of technically focused opportunities are uh, through a thing called Tech Congress. Um, has anyone here been a part of Tech Congress, Tech Congress fellows? One, yeah, great. Um, so they often place technical experts uh, in the halls of Congress to provide the exact kind of technical support we've been talking about. Um, this is a great way to work the system from the inside. Um, and then lastly, if, if things are, are not forthcoming, we, we ask for records uh, through FOIA, uh, Freedom of Information Act, um, and, and through sort of oversight hearings. Um, this is when parts of Congress watch what the executive agencies are doing. Um, so you can often provide questions um, that you think uh, members of Congress should ask. Um, this is a good way to at least raise awareness around an issue. Um, we spend a lot of time engaging uh, in the nonprofit world with the executive branch, uh, mostly through the agencies. Um, the, we'll do a little bit of law background here. The Administrative Procedure Act uh, requires that agencies who are uh, making, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get the language wrong, but making determinations uh, about legislation uh, right, they, they, are, they are tasked with uh, implementing and enforcing the laws that Congress passes. Um, and so they do that through uh, rulemakings. So the, the, the legislative language is often very broad, very vague, uh, does not give guidance to those who are uh, subject to it. So the agencies are then tasked with refining that language into uh, things that people can actually implement. Um, they do this through rulemakings. Uh, and the APA requires that they at least go through a public comment, um, notice and comment phase. So the notices will appear on the Federal Register. Um, there is usually at least 30 days, sometimes 60 or 90 days, uh, in which you can file a comment on the proposal. Um, sometimes there's a reply round where you can talk about all the things you agreed with or disagreed with uh, that other people said in the first round. Um, we spend a lot of time filing these comments. Uh, again, it doesn't always change the outcome, uh, but uh, it does force the agency to acknowledge that people have issues with what they're, what they're putting forward. Um, and it creates a public record of that. Um, this comes in handy later when you end up suing the government over something they did. Yes, yes question yeah. in the back. Um, so, I'm hoping that the Sure. Um, we're going to talk about that a little bit um, when we get to. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, so the question was about sort of uh, tips and guidance on what a comment should look like. Um, what makes a good comment? Uh, what makes a successful commenting attempt? Um, <laughs> so comments sometimes change the outcome. Sometimes they don't. Um, 
we can talk a little bit uh, about what makes a good comment, um, but I would also point you to the Grail website. Um, there is a, that's uh, grailnetwork.org, for those of you looking. Um, there's a document on there that gives that exact kind of, of guidance, um, sort of what the structure and substance and um, overall impact of the comment might do um, in terms of framing. Um, I don't know, do you want to take a break and talk about just what comments look like for yeah. a minute? Yeah, we can. Um, no, it's okay, this is. Um, yeah, I'm, no, I think this is good to talk about now. Um, so first of all, um, anyone can comment on a rulemaking and it does not have to be in a special format and it doesn't have to be fancy and it does not have to address the entire rulemaking. It can address one small part of it. It can address whatever you want to address. Um, and I think one of the most important functions of comments is to raise things that you don't believe the agency has sufficiently considered in its proposed rulemaking. Or if there are things in the proposed rulemaking that you think are very important and don't want, you don't want to see come out of that proposed rulemaking in the final rule, um, supporting why those things are important. Um, so I actually think the first step to having a good comment is just being focused about why you are commenting, what you think the agency missed, or what you think the agency is doing that you don't want to see go away. And so I think once you have that purpose and focus, it's easier to um, write a comment that is directed toward that purpose. Um, so in terms of you know people who have um, expertise in um, technology, uh, to the extent that the agency does not seem to be um, understanding the implications of a particular technology, either that is mentioned in the rule itself or that is implicated by the rule. Um, explaining those things is important. Um, I think as long as you are getting your point across clearly, I don't think that there is actually a right or wrong way to write a comment. Um, you know, we approach it the same way we approach most things that we write, which is like have a really clear goal, have really clear topic sentences about what you think is right or wrong about this, and then support them with research. Is that yep. Okay? Yeah, so the support with research is especially important. Um, that makes it even harder for the agency to sort of write off your comment as, as not responsive. Um, I will say in terms of uh, success, agencies like to be told they're doing a good job. Um, so even if you disagree with what they're doing, if you can say, it's good that you're doing something, but you should really be doing something more like this. Um, that often resonates more. Um, it's unclear how that, so when agencies get lots and lots of comments, um, right, they get sometimes millions and millions of comments. They're probably not reading all of those, right? People are not reading all of those. Um, and it's unclear what the review process is. Um, when they eventually respond to the comments um, in, their, in their final rule, you can tell if they read your comment because they will cite to it. Um, however, uh, there are many, many, many comments that never get cited to. Uh, I suspect the way they prioritize reading the comments is to sort them by page length um, and read the longest ones first. Uh, and then when they get down to those that are like two pages or shorter, probably not reading very many of those. Um, so while I appreciate uh, people being concise in their language, just to get noticed, you might want to hit somewhere around 10 pages um, <laughs> just, to, just to get them read. Natasha, what, what yeah. do you think, Natasha? Um, I'll just give um, one example that is not in the presentation. Um, this example is from a slightly more optimistic time in our country's history when the Federal Communications Commission was drafting broadband privacy rules. Um, and so when Stan sort of alluded to sometimes comments matter and sometimes they don't, sometimes it matters who is writing the rule and reading the comments. And in this case, um, it was uh, folks who were really interested in getting it right and hearing from people with a technical background because these rules were going to apply specifically to internet service providers and there, are, there were a lot of technical things to get right and um, 
you know, they wanted to, to make sure they got it right. And so, um, you know, CDT filed comments. Um, Upturn, though, also, um, I'm not sure if they filed comments or not because I wasn't there at the time, but they released a report called What ISPs Can See that went in, uh, in detail through um, uh, how much detail an internet service provider can see about what a person is doing online, even if they are, um, even if the traffic is encrypted. Because uh, that was one of the major questions and the, the thing that people were using to push back against the rules was, well, um, everything is encrypted now, so ISPs um, don't really see that much of the traffic. Um, and so, <coughs> that kind of stuff that is really targeted to a specific aspect of the rule um, and illuminating the technical realities for the agency. Um, and uh, I guess just to give the more sort of optimistic side of the coin of like sometimes it matters and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> yes, um, another question in the back. Please go ahead. So the question was whether um, some agencies may be better bets for engaging, um, where engagement might be more fruitful than others. Um, so our experience is um, a little bit limited, like we don't work with every agency. Um, so at least I'm not going to be able to speak to all agencies across the board. Um, I think um, I probably worked the most with the Federal Trade Commission, which um, is a fairly responsive body because um, they are, it's a bipartisan commission. Um, and um, they hold a lot of public hearings. However, they also have less power to make rules than other agencies. So they are probably more responsive but it's possible that down the road that leads to like actually less of a product. <laughs> um, but um, even when an agency is not likely to make a rule about something, um, they will sometimes be able to do a report or do research. Um, so it doesn't have to be rulemaking that you engage on. It can be a wide variety of things. That's not responsive to your question. Um, I don't, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say two more points before we move on. Um, one, the agency's responsiveness uh, varies with the administration, right? Um, mm -hmm. So depending on what the White House is saying to the agencies in terms of what their goals and priorities are, that will often determine sort of how uh, much weight they assign to any given comment, um, depending on its angle. Um, I would also say that uh, there is a certain amount of sort of reputation and connection effects um, in that for certain issue areas there are known, uh, known commenters that the agencies want to hear from um, and they tend to sort of, those are the people that get cited in the responses. Um, so aligning with, with one of them or, or sort of getting in that mix is a good way to, to make your voice louder. Um, yeah. But it's not, it's, not a, it's not a rule, right? Um, having, I think we've seen pretty good responses to sort of collective um, efforts by, you know, 20 to 50 computer scientists that get together and say, we all agree um, that these, five things are super important and you got three of them wrong or whatever, right? Um, that, that can carry a lot of weight. Yes, one more question. One more. Sure. Uh, 
Okay, two, two great questions. Um, the first was about, um, sorry, I, the groups, right. Um, and the second was about the, where the comment goes after you file it. Right, um, so filing a comment, uh, your comment becomes part of the public record forever. Um, that's why you do it. it uh, nowadays, they are hosted on the internet. Um, you can see what other people wrote. You can see what you wrote. They'll be up there as long as the government continues to support its websites. Um, I believe they're probably also part of the Library of Congress uh, after that. Um, so that's, that's how that works. Yes, your name is attached. Um, you cannot file anonymous comments, to my knowledge. Um, oh, can you? OK. I don't know why you would want to. Um, the, the name counts, right? And the, to get back to your group question, um, especially groups of experts makes for a, a pretty heavy hitting comment. Um, it's, it's hard for the agency to say, well, we read this comment that 700 people signed on to who all know what they're talking about, uh, but we're going to ignore them anyway and do what we wanted, right? It's, um, that is a, a substantial notice to the government and to the public that, that people are, are engaged, people who are experts on the subject matter are engaged, and, and it becomes part of the public record. Um, I'm going to say more about why that's important in just a second. Natasha, do you have anything else to, to add? Uh, just that uh, we've had people help us with comments behind the scenes who don't want to be on the record for whatever reason. Um, so that can be an option. Right. So you, you can have an impact without submitting your name um, by sort of aligning with other groups who will use your expertise but not your, not your identity. Um, so why is it important to file a comment even if it doesn't ultimately change what the agency does? It's so you can sue them later. <laughs> Um, you must have raised the issue in the notice and comment phase if you want to sue the government for doing the wrong thing afterwards. Um, and if it is not part of the record, you cannot file a claim because you didn't participate in the process, right? Um, so this is often why we file comments, is to establish all these points on the record so that after the fact, when the agency does whatever they were going to do anyway, we can say, no, no, we told you not to do that. We disagree with your outcome, um, and we think you should review your decision again. Um, I won't get too far into the intricacies of the APA and how that works, but basically you need to show that either they failed to consider something, they did a bad job of considering something, or um, they just ignored everyone's advice, um, and it looks like they were the, the key words are arbitrary and capricious decision making here. Um, so uh, that leads you into the next phase of advocacy and policy making, which is uh, if you are not the, the sort of plaintiff in the legal case, you can file uh, amicus briefs that help the court understand the issue. Um, this is also super important. Uh, courts are generalist bodies. They don't specialize, for the most part, in anything. Um, and they need help to understand the difference between uh, when the counsel on either side is telling them something that is absolutely true or something that is maybe not entirely representative of what's happening. Um, so expert witnesses, uh, sorry, expertise in amicus briefs um, really hit home with the court. They, the court appreciates knowing what's happening uh, sort of under the hood in the technology. Um, and it, depending on how you spend your brief, um, it, can, it can have a big impact for the court. Uh, same with expert witnesses. Um, many of you could be expert witnesses in a, uh, in a trial, right? Um, this, again, will help the court understand what's happening at a, at a fundamental level. Um, and then, as we've talked about with the commenting, you can, there, there's always the opportunity to provide technical support uh, for either the litigants or the amici filing in the case. Um, all right, I think we're going to move on now to an example. Um, 
do you want to take this one? You want me to, to lead into it? So, so Natasha alluded to this at the beginning of the presentation. Um, this is uh, HUD's attempt to create some new defenses for uh, algorithmic decision systems uh, employed in various uh, housing applications. Um, we, I say we, the, the advocacy community collectively became aware of this, um, read the rule, realized there were some problems with it, um, and started calling each other, right? Uh, have you read this rule? Are you gonna file? Um, it was a fairly large and diverse group this time, um, extending into not just sort of the tech policy space where, where we work, but into um, housing rights advocates um, and other more specialized uh, groups. Um, so just sort of talking through how that, how that process went. Um, we all started sort of having meetings and calls. We talked about uh, what was wrong with the rule, the sort of most appropriate responses to it. Um, and then there was some division of like, who's gonna make these points? Um, who is in the best position to make these points versus those points? Um, and it's not a, not a strict like, you can only cover these, these issues, but um, depending on sort of the names attached to your comments, they, they back, to your, back to your question, Chris John, they, they hit harder if this is, you know, here's a whole bunch of housing rights advocates um, saying, making the housing point, and then here's a bunch of uh, technical experts saying, and here's what you got wrong about your understanding of how algorithmic decision systems work. Um, so after that, uh, there is a good bit of writing, right? Comment writing takes some time, um, and then some review always improves the product. Um, and then it's time to decide, you know, whose name goes on what and whether you're gonna sign as an individual or on behalf of your uh, organization um, or institution. Um, so we still don't know if this was a successful uh, intervention yet. We have not seen the, the final rule from HUD, um, but it was a strong effort regardless um, because we had a really good mix of uh, the various professional disciplines involved. Um, we all agreed on, on what we were saying, so we were all sort of rowing the boat in the same direction. Um, that's super important also to the extent you can align with all your fellow commenters and not uh, cross paths or step on toes that that sends a much clearer signal to the agency um, that that you're all all speaking with one voice uh, we had great representation of both experts and stakeholders um, so all kinds of people all saying the same thing um, really lets the agency know that one lots of people care about it two to the extent that you can have sort of opposing groups align on an issue that sends a strong signal as well um, and then finally, uh, at least our comment had some super high quality writing by Natasha um, and was strengthened even further by the involvement of the, the CS community. Uh, many folks here at this conference ended up, ended up joining us um, and otherwise participating. You have a few more points? Yeah, there? actually, um, in the spirit of sort of demonstrating different ways um, that people can uh, intervene. I wanted to recognize that there was also a coalition of um, including civil rights and um, housing groups that did, um, a lot of them joined this comment, but they also separately um, set up a, a form that people could use to submit a comment where you know some of the basic information was filled in and then you just had to fill in sort of your um, personal take. and. That is something that um, you know you all can use to submit comments more easily without having to figure out like where it goes or who it goes to. But it's also a way that um, everyone can um, engage with the process uh, more easily. Um, so you know groups and individuals can send that out to you know large lists of people um, and have everyone submitting comments who would normally not necessarily um, be sort of keyed in. So. Uh, I note that we have about half an hour left, um, and we have a few more slides and issues to cover. We haven't even done the EU yet, um, but I want to get a sense for how many questions we may have at this point, because we would much rather answer your questions than uh, talk at you. So one, two, 
a few. Um, what do you think, Natasha? Three. Should we just should we just um, Q and A for a bit, or yeah, what's the or next quickly? Slide? Uh, the next slide is about the ice extreme bedding. Oh yeah, we can skip that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so, in the interest of doing both things, we might skip through and hit the highlights of the remaining slides, and then devote the rest of the time for Q and A. All right. If anything that I zip past too quickly on the screen is of interest, please raise your hand and I will, I will go back. Uh, these are the sort of major elements of the, the ICE um, advocacy effort. Yep. Oh, sorry. <laughs> too fast already. Um, I've talked about this before and I'm happy to talk about it more, but yep. I think it's more important that we go to questions. Um, but this was basically an example of um, finding out something that's going on through procurement documents and then partnering with a large coalition and having like a very multi-pronged strategy. So um, a congressional strategy, a communication strategy, a um, corporate pressure and advocacy strategy, um, and involving computer scientists in explaining like why the um, idea of the use of technology here was misguided. Um, this was ultimately trying to stop ICE from uh, purchasing uh, tools that would vet visa applicants to the U.S. based on their social media and other information on the internet to decide whether they would be possibly contributing members of society. Happy to talk more about that in person after the session. <laughs> uh, any questions about this slide in particular before we move on? Okay. Um, and I apologize to all of you because we're going to skip over what we had planned to do for a break time and just get done with this. Sorry. Um, so not break time. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to quickly cover just the structure and internal workings of the EU as I understand it. Um, <laughs> It's confusing for us in America to talk about this, but it is also um, a sort of very forward-thinking uh, body in terms of, of regulating um, issues in the tech space, um, particularly now, right? The GDPR just happened. They're really doing a lot of work on data and AI. Um, so back to a very high level here. Uh, the EU is comprised of the European Commission. Um, I think of the Commission as sort of the, the head. Um, it comes up with the ideas, uh, decides what it wants to do. Um, the Council uh, is composed of the presidents of each of the member states. Um, the Council is responsible for sort of pointing the body in the general direction that they all agree they want to go. Um, they are almost entirely aligned with the commission in every aspect of policy making. They rarely uh, diverge, at least in my, in my experience. Um, and then what keeps the rest of the body sort of attached to reality on the ground and moves it forward is the parliament, right? These guys, uh, approve or disapprove of the legislative proposals that come out of the commission um, and are the democratic representation uh, in, the, in the EU. Um, there are, I don't even know how many MEPs, um, but many of them are very accessible. Um, this is a great sort of ground level way to get involved in policy making is to either follow their Twitter feeds or sort of get at them directly. Um, okay, uh, here's kind of how it works in the EU. Um, so they have the high level bodies that issue uh, the, the overarching kind of policy goals, uh, but there are all sorts of specialization uh, and specialized bodies that, that delve into one aspect of that or another, um, both uh, sort of at the EU level and at the member state level. Um, I know there is a sort of alphabet soup up here. Um, the two main courts are the European Court of Justice, um, either ECJ or CJEU. 
and the ECHR is the European Court of Human Rights. Um, these guys are the sort of top level courts. Um, we rarely work at the um, sort of in litigation in the EU, so I can't say a lot more about how that works. Um, uh, but then there are also sort of uh, advisory and guidance bodies. Um, so many of you may have followed the Commission's high-level expert group um, on AI in their their effort to get um, sort of a policy or strategic level document about trustworthy AI. This was a year ago or so. Um, likewise, the European Data Protection Supervisor um, is responsible with uh, responsible for sort of overseeing GDPR implementation. Um, some of the committees in Parliament are, are specialized as well. There's uh, sort of internal market and consumer protection, um, industry, science and research. Uh, jury is the legal affairs committee. Um, and then there, there are more. Um, all of their websites, all of the EU uh, government websites are pretty good. Um, they do a good job of saying what's, what's available, what you can, how you can get involved. Um, uh, they, they are, I think, good examples of a government being about as transparent as they, as they can be. Um, let's see here. So much like in the U.S., um, they do the equivalent of notice and comment there. They issue public consultations on uh, either draft documents or sometimes more final documents. Um, they engage with expert groups. Um, and then, as always, you can contact your MEP directly. Um, all the same rules apply uh, to sort of the strength and quality of comments um, in the EU. However, uh, they are not always just an open format, uh, send us a PDF type comment. A lot of them look like this. Uh, they are question and answer. Um, sometimes you get the opportunity to provide a limited amount of characters explaining your answer, but a lot of them are just, um, you know, do you think we're doing a great job or do you hate puppies kind of questions. Um, they're, they're not always that slanted, but many of them are clearly advancing what, um, what the commission wants to do and doesn't provide always the best, uh, most satisfying opportunity to respond. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so the big takeaway here is that you all live in places where there are representatives um, who can hear from you. Um, so uh, in the U.S., you know, states and cities are um, right now some of the most productive venues for actually getting um, policies made or not made, um, and. Uh, it's really easy to call up your state legislature. Um, all you have to do is, is meet one staffer who is working on tech-related stuff or whatever it is you're interested in and get to know them, and they will email you when they need you. Um, it's really that simple. Um, it's not complicated. The thing to know about states, though, is that um, they all operate on slightly different schedules, so you just have to find the relevant information um, where you live um, to know like when the legislative schedule is, um, when they're in session, uh, what the deadline is for having bills introduced, um, and all sort of work slightly differently. Um, but they will often, even when they're not in session, have meetings where they'll hear from stakeholders. So I was just in um, at the Maryland legislature um, where they are talking about passing a law similar to the um, California privacy law that um, just took effect. Um, and they had a meeting before the session officially started to hear from stakeholders. Um, you know, it was just sort of one staffer for one legislator who called, you know, me and one other advocate and asked us to come. And every um, sort of corporate lobbyist in Maryland was also at the meeting. Um, so it's really important that um, they know who they can call to provide other types of perspectives that are needed. Yeah, they, they need help and they welcome it. 
Um, so I encourage, just, just like Natasha did, any of you who are interested in getting in the policymaking process, start at the, at the local and state level. Um, it's, it's a good place to get in. Um, we're, we're almost there. You want to oh. quickly do yes. this? Um, so, right, policy is, isn't just government policy, and it's not just algorithms. It's also um, the policies and practices that companies engage in. Um, they determine, um, you know, how systems are designed and um, what resources, um, you know, what things cost, like basic things, and, and of course on the tech side, like how platforms are designed and things like that. Um, so there are a lot of different avenues for um, impacting uh, what companies do and how. Um, there's, of course, advocacy from within. Um, uh, and there is advocacy from the outside, so um, things like testing. Uh, at Upturn, we have partnered with researchers to, uh, te to run tests on Facebook's um, advertising system. Um, resulting in you know findings of how um, ad targeting or ad delivery can be discriminatory um, and obviously a lot of other other great work um, like the the gender states work showing that um, face analysis systems um, have disparities uh, when it comes to um, darker skinned women versus lighter skinned men um, so a lot of great examples um, that we don't have time to go through all of them but um, just remember to think of company practice also as policy and as an avenue for potential change. Yeah, I'll just say, since they are not uh, public facing like the government is, it can be harder to sort of get through the door. Um, and I don't have great advice on how to do that other than to say that groups like Upturn and CDT often do have uh, the ear of companies. And so to the extent we can partner with anyone who really knows more about what's happening than we do, um, that's one way to sort of get get into that space as well. Um, okay, so uh, I will just let you guys look at this while we go to Q and A. These are four sort of high level um, opportunities to provide comments on uh, national level um, AI related things, um, sort of now and in the near future. Uh, but unless Natasha has anything else, I think we will just open the floor to Q&A. Yes. Should we you want to do the microphone? Yeah, or? I can, yeah. Right here. Uh, thank you. So you had a slide uh, talking about how people, how computing expertise can be used to give comments. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how non-computing expertise can help in policy making having to do with AI and machine learning. So people from, you know, social sciences or humanities, what kind of input would be interesting to you? So that's one question. And another question is whether you can recommend any resources for someone who might want to transition from academia or industry into mm -hmm. policy making? Okay, two great questions. Um, I'll take a shot at both of them and then Natasha, if you want to weigh in also. Uh, on the first question, yes, of course, all uh, fields of expertise should, should weigh in. And to the extent that uh, our representatives in Congress and expert agencies are not sort of adept with the technological language. Social sciences may have uh, even greater impact, right? If you can say things about how this impacts people rather than here's the minutia of what is going on with this algorithm, uh, that may resonate even more. Um, so I would encourage, yes, expertise of all kinds should, should get involved. Um, in terms of transitioning into the policy space, um, Go for it. <laughs> we, need, we need experts. Um, I think you'll find at least many of the established uh, advocacy groups are eager to work with folks um, from, from other professions. Um, a lot of them are hiring. Um, sorry. So, 
So CDT is hiring currently, although I'm not sure that um, how, uh, if, if it's specific to any one field or another, but we have quite a few positions available right now. Please check out cdt.org slash careers um, <laughs> for more info there. Natasha, what do you, what do you have? Who else is hiring? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so places to look, I will plug one from my alma mater at the University of North Carolina. Um, there's a center for media law and policy there. It's kind of an, a misnomer. It's not just media law, it's internet and technology and all the things. Um, but they have a jobs board um, that I think is pretty good. And when I see good jobs, I send them there. Um, the other, some of these are like listservs that are not open, but I think are not that hard to get access to. Like um, EFF's former interns listserv has a lot of good um, jobs, and um, EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, I mean, I think it's supposed to be for former interns, but like. It's just, it's mostly jobs. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, well, I was going to say, once you, if you can get connected with a few advocates uh, via Twitter or otherwise, you'll quickly be networked with all, all the rest of what's happening um, in that space. Um, and thank you also for your question. I'm now, as the administrator of the Grail Network website, inspired to add uh, a similar sort of job posting and availability <laughs> page. So look for that in the near future. Um, Okay, more questions? Um, several. Hi, this is a similar question, but what can an early career computer scientist or researcher do to be better prepared for roles like, you know, the technical support that you're describing, like besides just publishing? Um, from my perspective, practice translating your research into um, more layperson friendly language um, because the work you do is important and what your research exposes is important for people to know but it's often uh, a barrier just the the format of it um, so that's that's one thing if you're in school take classes outside of your field I mean I think most people do that maybe it's that's too obvious but yep. um, even like uh, you know, I, I know a lot of people who um, were more on the technical side of things, but like took law classes when they were in grad school. Um, so maybe that's too obvious, but uh, that's, I guess, my best advice. Yeah, so, so this is also one aim of the Grail Network is to sort of help the technical community be more able to engage in policy making. Um, and we're making resources as best we can to, to facilitate that. But um, please talk to me after about Grail Network if you would like to become a member. It's super easy and free. Um, OK, more, more questions? Um, it seems like there's been a lot of attempts at using, um, in the examples you gave, uh, you know, algorithms or automated decision systems within government. Um, and so I was wondering, rather than waiting for a rule and commenting on it, has there been attempts at the state and or federal level at proposing sort of more sort of broad brush, brush legislation that would look at how it should be used um, in you know, specific use case, whether it's employment or, um, I don't know, just, just an example, uh, rather than waiting for something to, to go wrong? Yeah, um, so there are several states um, where there's been proposed legislation around things like um, uh, risk assessments. Uh, I think both on the side of actually doing criminal risk assessments, with Chris John might know more about than I do, but also actually forcing companies to do risk assessments of their algorithms generally. Um, so there was... Um, there's a federal bill about this, the Algorithmic Accountability Act, but it was also introduced in New Jersey. Um, I've been contacted by people in um, Maryland who are interested in doing that. Um, in New York City, and I think it's Vermont, there are 
task forces to study how the city uses algorithms and um, how it might have um, impacts on um, justice and access and fairness. Um, you can read AI Now's work on how the process in New York is not going ideally. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I don't mean to like hold any of these up as the solution, but um, the answer is just generally like, yes, there are lots of things going on. Um, in uh, the case of the disability algorithms that I was talking about earlier, um, this was before I came to Upturn, so I'm not gonna have like a perfect accounting of this, but there was one case in which um, a lawyer in Missouri whose um, clients were complaining or who people were complaining to her about getting their hours cut, um, uh, she had the algorithm um, uh, the, and the Excel sheet that the um, state was using to calculate benefits and um, she sent it over to Upturn and they did like a, you know, they spent like a few hours testing it to see whether it was even doing what it was supposed to do um, and, you know, so you can also just take that stuff to a state legislator and say like, you know, something's going wrong here. Because legislators don't just have the ability to pass laws, they can also perform an oversight function. So they can request information from agencies or companies um, and perform sort of um, reviews about what systems are doing. And um, so that's a, another tool that can be used. Um, they don't necessarily have to pass a law to stop something bad from happening. <coughs> So um, thank you very much. Uh, I first wanted to comment that the thing you said about states moving fast, yes. In Idaho, the discussion of pretrial risk assessment went from op-ed from a legislator to House Judiciary Committee hearing on bill in less than two weeks. Um, and kind of caught a lot of people by surprise. But the question I wanted to ask was that out of that experience, what suggestions or thoughts do you have around understanding and navigating the political landscape of policy, particularly in regards to the different motivations, stated or unstated, that may be going on in aspects of the policy making. Um, and I think particularly the bail bond industry has a very deep interest in what happens with pretrial risk detention because they want providing bonds for cash bail to continue to be a, a thing. And, but that, that doesn't always manifest as them saying, don't do this because we want to keep making money. It happens a lot more covertly. So how do you, what comments do you have on how to navigate, understand, and then use that understanding as we're engaging with the process? So uh, I have two, and then Natasha may have more. Um, one, having a local partner uh, who under, is, is already more engaged in the, in the uh, state or local scene is one good way to have a better understanding of what's actually happening um, sort of under the surface. Uh, but if you don't have that, every state has a um, lobbying disclosure requirement rule, um, which, which, you know, if you are sort of talking directly to lawmakers or spending money to try to get something passed through, uh, that is also, you have to say, we you know, spent this many hours talking to lawmakers and we spent this much money taking them out to dinner. So that is one sort of proxy indicator for who's doing what. Um, might not always tell you what they're doing, uh, but at least is an indicator of sort of relative importance and, and attention there. Um, in the HUD process, before they issued the notice of proposed rulemaking, there had already been um, previous requests for people to comment on whether enforcement of the existing disparate impact rule was working and um, you know there you could see comments from various industries um, like the like how home loan underwriters uh, who were interested in uh, how their algorithms would be governed um, so looking back at um, Comment histories or even um, legislative histories uh, is is a way if you have the time to do it, which I realize not everyone does. Yeah. Um, um, one more sort of at the federal level, and it may also be a thing at the state level, um, is that if you are talking directly to an agency, perhaps to try to influence them to move their uh, rules or regulations in a particular direction, you have to 
uh, file a what's called an ex parte letter saying we had this meeting, we talked about this, um, and so those are also public record. Um, so you can get an idea of just the kinds of things that people are talking to regulators about um, before a lot of times, you know, there's a large lead up process where those conversations happen um, officially and unofficially sometimes um, before there's sort of agency action on any of those. Yeah, one last thing when we were doing the um, work um, on the ICE issue, um, the immigration vetting issue, um, so we went to what used to be FedBizOps and is now SAM.gov, the place where government agencies post requests for um, contracts, for people to bid on contracts. Um, and uh, it's not just the requests for contractors that are there, but um, sometimes agencies host industry days, which is where they try to see just like what industry can offer them before they actually formulate a request. Um, and so in that case, we had the information from the industry day. We had sign-in sheets from which companies attended the industry day and records of the Q&As so we could see what the companies asked and what the agency answered. So I, I see we're at time now, and I'm not sure what happens in this room after. Um, but I know we are both uh, available, at least for the next little bit, to answer questions uh, in person. Um, thank you all very much for your attendance and participation.